Yep. That's all right. All right. has started. All right, cool. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. All right, excellent. So thanks, guys, for coming, right? Like, you know the drill. It's week three. You've already had two or three of these guys already. I lost count. I guess that's the point of the number. All right, anyway. So the central point of what we're doing over here is understanding mechanical components that we're going to be using or that we typically use in RoboJackets and really you'll learn, use everywhere because they don't really change that much. So what exactly is a fastener and why do you need them? So like it essentially just joins two pieces of material together. And like the reason why it's important to focus on these, even though they sound a little bit boring, is that you need to be able to account for fasteners during the design process and their like placement, the quantity and size, like have the potential to make or break a project. And also like um, I've had instances in the past where just the all the fasteners themselves kind of accumulate a lot of weight throughout the entire robot. And uh, the robot ends up being like 10 pounds heavier than expected just because, you know, we forgot to add weight to those fasteners. All right, so a couple different types of fasteners that you'll see. So the first one is a bolt. You see that on the top left, right? You've definitely seen these around before. Like honestly, anything that has any like screws, uh, like maybe even, What's a good example? So like in the back of your calculator, for example, you'll have a bunch of screws or bolts kind of work similar. We'll get to that in the rest of the presentation, but essentially like those threads on the end of the bolt, along with like a nut or with a threaded hole are able to kind of press down together uh, between two different things. And that force of friction is really what, and that uh, normal force provided by, you know, the bolt head as well as the nut or whatever material are what's really using, uh, or what's really creating that fastening strength, right? We also have a washer, you see on the top right, we'll get to it in a little bit. We also have pins, so those help us uh, in cases where you want a rotational degree of freedom around that, or you know, that's just like, you put it in a hole, and as long as you have two of the same holes like lined up, then it'll stop any motion between the, the two parts uh, relative to each other. There's also something special called a set screw. Those are a lot more, I guess, niche, but essentially you'll see them a lot. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about the use case later. We also got rivets. Rivets are really fun. I, I enjoy, I like rivets quite a bit. Like um, if you ever get a chance to design something with rivets, right? Like please do so because it's honestly like if you have a rivet gun and you have put the rivets in there, it like um, essentially flattens out the other portion of the rivet, right? So like on screen, you see how there's like a flat head on here. On the other side with like a pneumatic tool, it'll flatten it out, right? So then essentially you have a permanent uh, nut and bolt kind of thing going. And super fun to use, super quick to assemble stuff with and highly recommend. And they're also used on airplanes, for example, because they're very lightweight uh, with regards compared to like their strength, right? All right, moving on. Within the, the bolts family of fasteners, we got li lots of different types. Uh, so obviously like you have flathead, uh, there's a little bit of a countersink angle to it. So you can use that uh, to fit flush with any sort of surface. You have socket head, right? Instead of a countersink, it's a counter bore kinda. And again, you can use it for that exact same reason. Uh, honestly, all these are uh, kind of the same, kind of different, except for the shoulder screw. That has a specific use case that's a little different than the other bolts that you see on here, right? So with the shoulder screw, what's nice about it is that there is this one, uh, I guess, really smooth uh, edge or a smooth face that you have on there. Typically, you'll see these whenever you have like suspension joints or like any sort of pin joints, just because that smooth surface allows you to have a rotational degree of freedom about that axis and You'll see it used quite often, honestly. So next slide. Some important things to note about bolts. Um, I'm sure you guys are used to this. I, I don't think I need to tell you this any more than you already know, but the Imperial system is trash. I'll just be honest, right? Like as much as I like freedom units, it's very obvious metric is better. So in metric, the first number that you see, so like an M4 times 0.7, that's the nominal size, so it's like uh, for a four millimeter hole. The second one is the pitch, so that's the distance between each of the threads. So that'll be 7, 0.7 millimeters between each of the threads, right? And imperial, right, the first number uh, is a number that corresponds to the normal size, right? In 
in an actual chart, you'll see what the whole size is at, you actually need this for. It's a little wonky, uh, so that's a little annoying. And then the second number is the threads per inch, so it's the reciprocal of thread pitch, right? Uh, honestly, like the only thing that I'm going to complain about, like that second number, is just because like pitch is actually used in machine design equations, and I've never seen like threads per inch be there unless if it's like one divided by pitch, right? It's just a little bit annoying. And here, here's the catcher, right? So for anything that's smaller than a quarter inch in uh, nominal diameter, right, they're given a number between 0 to 12, right? So I'll be honest, like just looking at these numbers, like the 440, 256, and 832, even those are very commonly used, I still don't know what their actual like nominal diameters are. Uh, but just so you know, like you can just look up what that first number corresponds to and you know what like um, – what diameter to make your holes, uh, what kind of bolt uh, nuts you need, and stuff like that, right? Next slide. Another thing to note about bolts is that they come in two different flavors. That's a uh, coarse and fine, right? Uh, we typically use coarse thread. It's easier to obtain, and they're also cheaper, if I recall correctly, for the most part. Uh, fine is a little bit stronger, right? Uh, but you, you should only really use them if there's a good reason to. And the other thing with fine threads that's not listed here is that with fine threads, the uh, uh, there's a bunch of uh, literature like in research that basically is proven that like the finer the threads are, the less likely that that uh, that bolt is going to come loose, right? So it's very resistant to any sort of vibration loosening uh, up that thread, right? The other thing to note about bolts is that when you see like a length specified on like any sort of website, it's measured by the amount of the bolt that goes into the material, right? So that'll be from the, uh, over here on the right, you see like a hex head. So it'll be from the bottom of that hex head all the way to the, to the end, right? And that's typically the case except for flat heads, which are, I think the, the ones that have a little bit of a countersink to them, all right? So some notes about like designing and like working with bolts. Generally, uh, you want at least the radius of the bolt in thickness around it. So essentially, like if you have a hole right over here, right, and you have some material. So imagine this is the hole. This is the edge of the material. This radius, right, of the of this bolt, you want to have uh, be at least the distance between there. So like, um, let's say if I have like a quarter inch uh, a hole, then you're gonna want to leave at least. Um, an eighth of an inch uh, of material between that hole and the edge of the material that you're working with. The other little, uh, what's it called, rule of thumb that you want to like work with is you want at least three threads past the nut and a diameter's worth of threads engaged, right? So whenever you're tightening things up or when you're looking at, um, you know, in your CAD models to see how much of the uh, bolt sticks out, this is generally what you want to kind of strive for, right? So like using like the, the, the thread pitch and the threads per inches, you can easily determine that by measuring the distance uh, that's, uh, you know, left outside of that nut, right? The other things to note are Phillips heads strip easily, right? I'll describe, uh, if you've never heard the term strip uh, in regards to, you know, uh, mechanical components, essentially what happens like when you strip a bolt, uh, it's either like the, the thread uh, starts like kind of disintegrating. I'm not going to say disintegrate, like starts eroding away if you like tighten it a little bit too much. Or like if you have uh, a Phillips head, so like those guys that have a little cross on the top of them, if you put your screwdriver in there and the screwdriver tend, like slips a little bit, then because, you know, you have steel on steel, typically that uh, screwdriver is going to start picking away at the uh, Phillips head. So when we talk about stripping away the material, that's literally what's happening. Like whenever you're interfacing two different materials and you're trying to move them, then uh, yeah, that kind of ruins the connections there or you know what you actually use to fasten the component. Uh, what what else? So only the bottommost part relative to the boat should be uh, to the bolt should be tapped, and the rest should just be clearance holes. If that makes sense. Uh, let's go next slide. Now I've used I've used bolt and screw kind of interchangeably, and the reason for that it's like they're very similar. So with a bolt, you require a nut or like a threaded hole in order to make that joint lock, right? They also have a constant diameter, and they require a hole to be inserted, right? 
On the other hand, screws, you'll you'll especially see this with uh, wood screws, right? Um, they're always used without a nut, so they actually go into the material directly. It has a non-uniform cross-section and can be inserted without a hole, right? But, you know, best practice so you don't break the material or and you don't break the uh, the bolt, right? Or, sorry, the screw, uh, is that you want to make a hole that's slightly smaller than the um, actual diameter of the screw itself. So that way when you uh, ease it in, right, you're not going to be moving that much material as you're... Uh, fastening it all the way in, right? So this prevents the both the screw from getting ruined and it prevents the material from splitting apart. Okay, another, so I talked about washers a little bit before, but here's like the, the main use case. So washers are really used to disperse the load from a bolt over a large surface. And usually they're under the head of the bolt and sometimes under the nut as well. And there's a couple different flavors of them as well. You have a lock washer, so essentially like, um, the one of the surfaces of the lock washer is slightly uh, a joint from the uh, surface of the other one. And that's so that way when you actually fasten the bolts and the nuts themselves, uh, that lock washer is going to be providing more of a force in the, the axial direction uh, to the bolt. And this helps ease some of the uh, tension that's uh, typically found or ease some of the compression that's uh, typically found in uh, uh, the bolt itself or provide more force uh, of friction. Uh, there's also lock washers and regular washers. Uh, Sam, do you remember exactly what lock washers are used for? I think they're used in plumbing, like pretty often, but I can't remember a single use case that uh, I've seen in robo jackets. But in case I you do not uh, know, yeah, no worries. But in case you see these, right, like uh, I think most of the applications come down to plumbing. And then you have a regular washer, and you're just dispersing the load from the head of that bolt all over, all across that. Uh, uh, what's it called that washer? What's also really nice about using washers is if you want to, if you you don't want to scratch the surface of the material that you're working with, right? Like maybe it's painted over or whatever, or you just want to avoid like electrical contact between stuff, right? Uh, you can you put a washer there, and since that washer is going to be staying in place for the most part, and that bolt is really going to be kind of uh, interacting with the surface of the washer you can prevent the bolt itself from scratching the material that you're trying to fasten together. And sometimes that's really helpful. Okay, let's go to nuts. So whenever you tap a hole, you, uh, you can make it so that the bolt doesn't need a nut, but you know, you, you gotta check the thread engagement of the hole anyways. Uh, you can also add a add thread locker. So like an adhesive where there is potential for the bolt to loosen. So it makes it very similar to like a, a lock nut in a way and lock nuts are these the second guy from the left um, and essentially they have a bit of nylon at the end of the nut so that way when the bolt actually like screws in right it deforms that nylon and it has a huge huge amount of friction between them and that typically prevents the bolt from coming loose right and like I said earlier that rule of thumb uh, you want at least three threads sticking out of that nut now pins so Kind of what I was talking about before, right? Uh, it, it's usually used for locking two parts together and it could also be used as a first point of failure, right? What's really nice about pins uh, compared to, you know, washers, thread, screws, all that sort of stuff uh, is that dowel pins are super, super simple to analyze. And if you really want, since they're usually pretty cheap and, you know, their geometry is like fairly simple, you can essentially like design your parts such that the first thing that fails is the dowel pin and that nothing else really fails around it. So uh, that's a very helpful thing. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure BattleBots designs for stuff like this, but I would have to check in. Uh, since none of the trainers over here are BattleBots on so me and Sam, uh, I would have to check back on with you on that one. Now set screws, these are used everywhere and they're actually super helpful. Uh, so essentially these interface with a shaft and an object that needs to rotate with that shaft. Right, so it requires a flat on the shaft itself just so you can have a good interface and it comes in standard bolt sizes both in metric and imperial. So what's up with the set screw itself is uh, you have a side on one end that has like a, what's it called, like an Allen key head for you to, you know, screw it in there, right? So there's nothing that's jutting out and that's really the, the main thing about that. But the, on the other side, there's another flat face that you can interface with something else. And as you can see in the uh, cross section of the gear on the right, 
there's this shaft over here that's kind of cut down the middle and you have this set screw so essentially like if you want to fix this gear to this uh this shaft you can either use something called a keyway i don't think we cover that here but it's probably used later uh, but essentially like if you tighten down this set screw through the gear itself and have it interface with the shaft you prevent that uh gear from moving anywhere because this uh interface provides a moment to counteract that right can i interrupt her for a second yeah go for it okay so for people who can see my screen this is a door handle um and this right here is a set screw and it's super tiny but it came loose so that's why my door handle is not on my door right now um <laughs> but what happens is if it, if you tighten it in then it applies pressure on the inside to the uh the axle coming out of the door so that, that's how it attaches and stays firm. So I need to get a hex key and tighten it so that I can have my handle back. Wait, that's kind of funny. If you live on 8th Street West, I also had a loose doorknob just like that. And uh, I haven't fi I didn't fix that the entire year that I lived there. Yeah, I live <laughs> it upside down. Yeah, and yeah, but that works enough. But essentially, that's a good use case, right? That Just tighten that set screw so that uh, that doorknob doesn't come loose. Yeah. All right. And kind of what I was talking about before, let's uh, let's get back to the lecture, right? Uh, here's an example of two materials being fastened together, right? Uh, so in this case, you have the this uh, uh, diagonally striped material on the top and then the opposite diagonally striped material on the bottom. You have a screw over here, uh, or sorry, not a screw, a bolt right on there. And you have a nut and a washer on the other side, right? So essentially like uh, as you tighten this guy over here, it just creates a force of compression over here to prevent these uh, plates from both sliding and from moving away from each other. All right. So yeah, material one, material two, here's a bolt, here's a washer, and here's a nut. Easy peasy, nothing too complicated. So I was talking about fasteners most of this, uh, this discussion or most of this uh, class uh, just to uh, you know, give you an introduction on what's really easy to do and what's really commercially available. But there's a lot of other ways uh, to join materials that, you know, require a little bit of uh, finagling with design and, uh, but they're still very, very helpful. And you'll see this all the time with like bearings, um, you know, uh, whenever you need to assemble shafts together, if you need to adhere two surfaces together, right? So like this is kind of like a duct tape solution, but sometimes it's actually a, a, a viable uh, design solution. There's also welding, right? So with friction-based methods, we have like a, a press fit, taper fit, shrink fit. Uh, with shaft assemblies, we have shaft collars and retaining rings. And with it, adhesives, we have like epoxy and Loctite are like the big main two. And with welding, you are uh, joining two pieces of metal by uh, applying heat and force, right? Let's go on. So kind of what I just mentioned, the, the three types of fit, right? So in each of these fits, right, you have essentially like a, a shaft that is given a particular dimension uh, in order to fit interface with another hole. So in a press fit, uh, this diameter of this shaft right here is actually larger than the diameter of the hole. So that way, whenever you, you, you have to de deform the shaft itself in order to insert it into that, uh, that hole, right? And essentially that creates a huge force of friction in there and it's really, really hard to take stuff. Uh, out of there. Typically, like you see this used, uh, for example, uh, but there's also another other use cases like uh, puzzle fits that BattleBots uses quite often. And uh, honestly, like I'm blanking on, on, on a couple other examples, but you'll see this everywhere, honestly. There's also a taper fit. So like it, this is an interference where like the fasten, fastener is tightened so that the uh, parts are kind of drawn together, right? So like you have one shaft that's, uh, what's it called? kind of shaped like this and you have the hole that's also shaped like this except a little bit outwards and uh, this just helps it align it a lot easier and you'll see this in manufacturing operations just because if you have a tapered fit it's a lot easier to align than just a straight hole right so it's basically kind of a, a self-corrective measure in a way you also have what is known as a shrink fit this is used pretty often with battle bots if i recall correctly uh so essentially like um if you remember like either like MSC 2001 or like if you've ever heated anything up before uh, and you look really, really closely, uh, you'll notice that materials will tend to expand when you apply heat to them, right? So in a shrink fit, you're actually expanding the uh, hole itself 
right, by uh, applying some heat, or you can shr shrink the shaft by uh, up applying cold. So like either dip it in like some uh, liquid nitrogen or something. I don't think we've ever done that before. It just doesn't seem as practical as just heating up the other element. But essentially like once it cools down or it gets back to the, uh, you know, steady state temperatures, right? Uh, interference or like a press fit is kind of like made such that uh, that hole and that shaft are, you know, pressing up against each other pretty significantly, just like in a press fit. Now with shaft assemblies, I mentioned two specific things. There's our shaft collars and retaining rings. They're both uh, used for similar things, but essentially like um, in a retaining ring, right, you actually have to cut a groove into the shaft itself in order to put it on there. And you see these two little holes at the end of them, you just split them apart, put them around the shaft inside that groove and then put them back together again. Whereas on the other hand, these shaft collars, uh, you don't actually have to cut any grooves into them. They actually just slide on and you just tighten them either with uh, some bolts as you see like on the left two, right? Uh, so on the left one for just so you guys remember, that's a that's a set screw just because that's going, that's like a flat head going into a, uh, something that needs to be retained on the shaft, right? And over here, uh, you'll see this in like bikes and stuff. I don't remember what these are called, but I don't think RoboJackets uses them particularly often, so you don't have to worry about them too much. Uh, let's go hey, to Ed. Uh, Tomas, oh. we have a question from the chat. Uh, do we ever use hex shafts? Hex shafts. I don't think so. I don't think so either, but that might change. Uh, I know for... So what's nice about hex shafts is that that uh, provides you some uh, flat surfaces, kind of like with set screws and uh, you know shaft collars that prevent any sort of uh, rotation about like with respect to the shaft itself. Um, we might be using hex shafts for uh, what's it called in RoboNav because we're working on like the uh, a rover competition and we have to design a robotic arm. And for part of like the grippers themselves, we're considering using a hex shaft to actually allow the grippers to only slide in one direction, if that kind of makes sense, and not let them like uh, wiggle this way. Does that kind of answer your question? All right, yes. cool, no cool. problem. Feel free to ask any more questions uh, while we're having this class, all right? I, uh, I'm more than willing to, to stop and discuss some stuff, especially if you guys are interested in mechanical components, okay? All right, let's get back to it. Adhesives, right? The ones that we typically use are epoxies and Loctite. What's really nice about, uh, you know, uh, epoxies in general, right, is that uh, they can be used to waterproof things. So again, my experience with RoboNav, we typically line the borders of anything that's on the outside of our robot with epoxy, just because those epoxies will, will fill the space between uh, the, those two materials and won't let any water through. But if you really wanted to and you didn't want to design anything with uh, with bolts or welds or whatever and you want something that's a little bit weaker, I don't know why you'd use it, but you can do epoxy, right? We also have Loctite. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about the colors on there, right? But essentially like when you look up the Loctites and you get the specifications for what you need to work on, uh, you'll kind of figure it out. But essentially with Loctite, you apply this to threads or with anything that needs to be retained, right? So the red uh, Loctite itself, you can use, apply on like threads. So that way, remember when I was talking about like the nut with the nylon on the outside, essentially that thread will solidify uh, as it cures, right? And because it's like a solid epoxy, right? And it's a little bit rubbery uh, uh, to an extent, that's gonna create a ton of friction uh, within between the threads themselves. And that prevents these threads from really ever loosening. Um, we use this very often in, I, I know RoboNav for sure. I'm sure Robo Racing might have some uses for them. I actually uh, haven't used any adhesives, uh, at least in my experience. All right, no worries. But this other uh, retaining compound, as it's called, is used fairly often for some other stuff. Uh, so whenever you're putting a bearing into a pocket, right, uh, you need to get those tolerances down. So like the actual, you know, dimensions of the hole down to like a T, right? And um, if the hole is a little bit too big, 
what you can do it to get around it is use retaining compound and essentially like um it's just glue so like you you you'll use it for like bearings uh to to stick to pocket and that's pretty much it right uh, let's see next slide uh welding okay so this one isn't used as often in robo jackets uh, i know BattleBots uses it a crap ton. Now RoboNav has a use case for it, but we're going to be sending it to the machining mall anyways, uh, just because it's we're going to need a little bit more of an expert look on it. Uh, there's two types of welding that we're usually like concerned with. One of them is called MIG welding, and the other one is called TIG. So with MIG welding, we're typically using this on steels, and with TIG, TIG welding, you can use this on aluminum, right? Uh, I guess there's like a, a, a video link on there. Okay, give me a sec. I'm going to share the screen a little bit differently so you guys can actually watch this content. While he's doing that, uh, it's worth noting that most of the reason we don't use it here at RoboJackets is because uh, just not a lot of people know how to weld. Um, I technically learned this past summer, and it's really cool. I learned how to make welds because that's what we have in the shop. Um, but it's... It, as you can see, it's only used for steel and not for aluminum. Um, it's just, it just has to do with the properties. But if you can learn at any point, uh, I'd highly encourage it. It's a really useful skill to have just in general. Um, and we'd love to have that kind of skill on, uh, on robo jackets. Yeah, and the other thing is like, um, if you ever need training on a specific machine, Right. Uh, you can always like ask in like either the Montgomery Machining Mall, the Invention Studio, or you also have people in the SEC that can train you on them. Right. Uh, so like what you see over here on uh, on screen is that there's actually like a little bit of a wire in MIG welds, and uh, essentially you surround that with a inert gas. Right. Typically like uh, you know an ideal gas or not an ideal gas. Sorry, a noble gas. Yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, and essentially, like uh, that prevents the steel itself from like rusting before it gets to the other surfaces. And essentially, you're just melting the the crap out of that uh, wire material to actually join those two materials together. Okay. Now let's go to the TIG welding boy over here. Uh, one sec. Okay. The process is a little bit different, but. It's it's pretty similar. The, the, it's really like uh, you don't have to worry about what actually goes on in the midst of it, right? Um, you just have to know that. Wait, this is the exact. Oh no, this is the same uh, company, just a uh, different thing. Yeah. So for um, TIG welding, um, something I learned about it is if you've ever seen like a sewing machine where you have a pedal to use it, um, that's what it uses for TIG welding. So it's got a lot more control. Um, whereas with the, with MIG welding, you've got like a trigger that feeds at a really high, uh, speed and, um, people who are really good at welding make it look really easy, but I assure you it's not. <laughs> all right. I think that should be enough. Also a yeah. quick recommendation, uh, to all of y'all now that we're showing some machines being used. Uh, if you ever have spare time, I highly recommend you just look up like machining videos. Uh, they're really satisfying. They're kind of like visual ASMR in a way. It's just really, really just fun to watch. Uh, I'll definitely put that on at some point. I'm sure we'll encounter that in later lectures. All right, let's get back to the uh, lecture. Um, okay, another thing you have to take care of when talking about, you know, fasteners are really like designing anything that uh, interfaces two parts together is you have to make sure that when you're putting it together, uh, you're actually able to access all of those uh, fasteners and you have to really plan around, uh, what's it called? Like your assembly operation so that one doesn't really get in the way of the other, right? Uh, so like, for example, you just need bolt holes to be ac accessible for like assembly and disassembly at all times during your, uh, during what you're working on. But if you make it very close internally to the structure, right? You're gonna have to take a lot off, uh, right? If you wanna dis disassemble it, or if you screw up the, uh, what's it called? The order of assembly and you made a mistake, you're gonna have to go all the way back and you know design that. So what's helpful is like when you're actually designing parts, just keep the design for assembly like in mind, right? So like when you think about how those parts are gonna interface and in what order they should, right? It's really helpful to make sure like 
hey, do I have enough room for these bolts to be accessed by someone outside, right? Uh, if I assemble this guy first, are these going to, or am I going to be able to even access uh, these bolts uh, that, that I have on here and so on and so forth, right? Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. So let's uh, let's go over some like badly designed parts or like some examples. So with holes and screws, right? Uh, when you, whenever you design stuff uh, with screws, it's uh it's really helpful and recommended if you just stick to like a single set of uh, screws and bolts and make sure that you're sticking with uh you know one unit system, right? So even though I hate freedom units, right? Uh, sometimes you you're gonna have to use them anyways, and you know, Robo Jackets uses them anyways for a lot of stuff, right? Uh, some other things. So whenever you're designing any sort of assembly, you really want to try, try gonna try to reduce the number of types of screws, bolts, and nuts for an assembly itself, right? Just because this minimizes the possibility of mixing screws up, and this really reduces the stock that you're working with, right? I'll give you an example of this. So over the summer, I interned at John Deere and I had to design some stuff for uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, for a construction vehicle. And for part of it, I had to design like, um, what's it called? Some fasteners that are, were going to be welded. Uh, it's called a boss. They're not really used very often in robo jackets at all, but essentially it's just like uh, a cylindrical piece of stock, right? That you just put on there. And the when I was talking to what's it called, the manufacturers and the assemblers about my design, they're like, "Can you please just stick to like one uh, boss? Like this is gonna get mixed up like pretty easily." So like even though it sounds uh, kind of wacky and kind of like a non-issue, like in a lot of cases you should be careful about it. And uh, yeah, especially if you're working in the shop, not everything is labeled very well. So just you know. Keeping the same type of screws, bolts, and nuts for assembly is just like super helpful in general. And it also reduces cost because then you can uh, bulk order a lot of stuff and it ends up being cheaper because you use a lot less packaging as well, right? Uh, let's see some other things. So whenever you screw holes in metal and plastic parts, uh, they must be threaded if no locking is used, right? Um, and the other thing is like just refer to the screw chart in doubt when you're whenever you're in doubt so like whenever like uh you have two threads interfacing you want to make sure that you know you have enough room uh you have the right types of fits in there and so on and so forth okay now let's see uh some examples in cad for what we actually use remember those retaining rings that i was talking about so those things that you kind of just snap around a shaft so if you've ever if you've never used like a revolve cut before this is like essentially like a textbook use case for it. Uh, if you have the dimensions of the retaining ring that you have and they give you some specifications of like, let's say it needs to be like 0 0.001 inch bigger than the retaining ring itself, right? You can just, uh, you know, cut out, make a uh, like a trapezoidal or a rectangular cross section in this uh, groove over here and have it rotate around that shaft and get rid of all that material, right? And another thing that's like super helpful, and this is what I absolutely love about Inventor, right, uh, is that they have a very user-friendly whole interface. And uh, it's actually super helpful because you don't have to remember a lot of the stuff in the screw charts, right? So whenever you look at like uh, the models of the fasteners, like from the vendors themselves, uh, they'll give you like the dimensions and stuff. And then you, it's really up to you to determine like what kind of fits and stuff you work with you, right? Uh, but essentially, like, what Inventor does is instead of having to look up different charts for, like, different dimensions you need to make the holes in order for the bolts to fit in correctly, it stores everything into a big spreadsheet that it references in this uh, feature. So essentially, like, you just sketch uh, those hole locations that where you, wherever you want to put them on the part themselves. Uh, you, you go to the hole feature, uh, and then you use the hole properties manager that you see, like, over here on the right uh, to kind of select different hole types. And some different options are, uh, you know, simple hole. This is just where you have a diameter and you have a depth, and that's pretty much it. You're not going to look up any sort of uh, what's it called spreadsheet or any sort of like uh, chart. You know what you're doing, right? You're just putting that in there. I don't typically recommend that, especially if you're putting things together with fasteners, 
just because uh, it prevents you from making an oopsie whoopsie. All right. Now, clearance holes. These are super important, right? Like, uh, remember several slides back with uh, this bolt example, right? This is actually what is known as a clearance fit. So you're giving enough room for this bolt to breathe on both sides of uh, that bolt uh, between the materials, right? And what this lets you do is just like make sure that you have enough room for when you actually put the bolt in so that they don't actually interfere with each other whatsoever. Like uh, for example, for like a quarter 20 bolt, we typically use like 0.266 inches or something like that as the diameter just so that it fits nicely. And you don't have to worry about that. Like everyone has already done this work for you. Right, there's charts for this online, but again, like Inventor really does all that heavy lifting for you. There's also a tapped hole, right? That's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, you kind of just tell it like what screw thread to use, how far you want that uh, thread uh, to go in, and that's pretty much the end of that, right? Uh, and you also have a tapered tap hole, right? I have never really used that, I'll be honest. Um, I'm not really sure what that use case is either but I'm sure it's useful at some point. Uh, I've just never seen that myself. There's also some different options for you to actually like make that hole itself. So let's say instead of like making a hole and then another hole, right, to make like a, a counter bore. So like for a shoulder bolt, if you want it to, um, let's see, go all the way back here. Let's say you have like a socket's head, right, and you want that to fit flush uh, with the material, right? So it doesn't stick out. You can make what is known as a counter bore, like in the whole material, uh, the whole feature itself, that will basically take care of all those dimensions for you, right? Instead of having to make the uh, hole in two different steps itself. All right, let's get back to it. Okay. Uh, there's also spot face. I've never really used that before. Uh, but it, it's a thing. It's just like it, instead of uh, describing like what the counterbore needs to like be from like a specific like length, it'll say like a, an offset uh, from a from a distance, right? Uh, there's also a countersink. So with the Phillips head or like those flathead screws, instead of having like the shoulder heads be kind of like right side up, they're kind of tilted like this. Uh, that's another option. That's also really useful for making sure that bolts are flush and don't stick out but that's an option whenever you're using the whole feature, okay? Some other things. So whenever we're talking about fastening, remember how I talked about like epoxies and welding and all that stuff? We use that a lot for sheet metal parts, so we thought it'd be very helpful for you to understand that this is a thing. So whenever you actually like, um, what's it called? Uh, create a part, you actually have the option to make a sheet metal part instead, and there's a full fledged of different options that you can use instead. So like uh, instead of, you know, having to model like that plate first and then des describe like the sweep angle or like make a, another extrusion and then fill it on both sides to like make the uh, part work itself, uh, right? You can just use like a, a flange operation, for example, and it'll do all of that work for you, right? You just have to specify like what angle and what bend radius you're going to use and that's pretty much it. And this is really helpful whenever you have like boxes or like any sort of like sheet metal parts that you want to actually bend just because then afterwards you can actually uh what's it called flatten out the part itself right uh and uh you can then water jet that uh uh really easily and then bend it yourself so with inventor right there's actually an option for you to like uh flatten out the part itself you can then uh, right click on the uh, face that you want to export itself, uh, export it as a DXF. That's like the, the part file uh, format that's used for the water jet. Bring it to the water jet, cut that out, and then just bend it uh, by yourself if you're really strong or with a bender, right? That's just the name of the uh, machine itself, right? Now, th the last thing that I want to go over, right? And this is a little bit of an aside for fasteners, right? Uh, so you have to take into consideration like different types of files uh, whenever you're working in the inventor. Like there's different uh, extensions and you, uh, like IPT is like the part file, .im is like assembly file and .idw or .dwg are for drawing files, right? Uh, so like I said before, right, there, whenever you create a new file in inventor, this pop-up window will show up and like, as you can kind of see, like both the sheet metal part and the standard parts, 
have the same exact extension, so you can use them in the exact same kind of way, right? Uh, however, like the sheet metal part is just going to contain like those extra little features that are built into the uh, GUI for you, like the user interface. Uh, some other things is that uh, please make sure that when you are making parts or assemblies, that you make each of the individual components like different parts and don't just lump everything into like one part file, right? Uh, it becomes really tedious. Uh, it's a lot easier to like locate where everything is if there are different parts. Um, and what's really nice about like making assemblies with all that stuff is like uh, it, you can break it down to like uh, smaller sub assemblies. So like uh, if you just wanted to, let's say, take a look at the gearboxes for something instead of the entire like huge uh, robot, right? And then just to find that like one gear that you're working with. Uh, you can just uh, look for the assembly for that subassembly, and you'll be all Gucci. All right. Some other things: whenever you're 3D printing, uh, they always accept STL uh, format files, right? So in our 3D printer, and actually I think most 3D printers, they accept millimeters as the input. So whenever you're saving as like an STL, right? So like you either go to like File Export or File Save As right, and uh, make it an STL. This pop-up window will come up for you and you can just like uh, either uh, scale it, right, and make it a, uh, what's it called? Um, or like just change the units to like millimeter like there instead of having to go into like uh, the properties for like that file, uh, change the units for the entire part to millimeter, save it as, and then change it back to Imperial, right? But essentially like, uh, 3D printers are only going to uh, use millimeters for the most part, so just make sure that you're clicking that whenever you're working with it, okay? Now it's time for Kahoot. All right, you guys ready? Okay, I actually didn't log in right before, but it should not be too bad. Give me a second. Yeah, so we talked a lot about uh, assemblies and stuff like that. Um, that's going to be covered in week six. Um, so just stick around and you'll, you'll learn all about it in time. Uh, another thing to note is when you're modeling with uh, screws and bolts, you don't actually have to model them by hand. Uh, you can usually go to a, a website called McMaster.com, um, and they've got all the files that you'd need. So you can just download um, the, the appropriate file and then just stick it into your assembly. Um, it's very handy. And again, we'll show you how to do that in week six. All right, so now the Kahoot's up if anyone wants to join. Uh, if we were in person, I'd give you candy for winning and slash like just participating. But unfortunately, like, uh, yeah, we just have to make do with what we have over here. Big Chungus is a dead meme. I appreciate the reference. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's just how everything goes. How many people do we have uh, in the call today? So uh, 14. 14? Okay. We'll just have to wait. AFK. I hope, I hope they're not AFK. <laughs> is Vegeta the same guy that uh, put Goku last week? Should I watch Dragon Ball? I've heard good things about it, but uh, I, I watched know. Dragon Ball Z abridged. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty entertaining. I, I've I've watched that too. That's that's funny. All right, I think well, let, let's let's go on before we all turn weeb. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's go. Mechanical week uh, week three. Hope you guys are ready. Why would you use the flathead bolt? Very nice. All right. So, yeah. All right, there we go. Let's go to the next question. Scoreboard update. Yeah, let's go. All right, qu quiz. Which of these aren't a real bolt?
Yep, that's right. Tapered is more of like a, a term for either like the fits or for, you know, like talking about like counter sinks and all that sort of stuff because, you know, uh, they taper outwards. They have uh, kind of increasing cross-sectional areas are going onto it, but that's not the name of any bolt. Whereas socket, uh, shoulder, and hex are different kinds of bolts that we've discussed in this uh, past lecture. All right. Get the scoreboard. Okay, true or false? So do screws and bolts have a constant diameter along the threaded body? So both of them. All right, very nice, false. Yeah, because uh, screws themselves don't have a constant diameter. And that's mostly because those screws are self-lathing. And whenever you go into a part, right, um, they design that intentionally so that way you don't have like the full thickness of that screw going going in at once and it doesn't uh, split the material that quickly. Okay, let's go to the next question. Okay, damn, Zach is on fire. Let's go. Which is not a way to constrain a shaft. Yes, very nice, lock washer. So I didn't really elaborate on much what lock washers were, but it's essentially like, uh, they're just like any other washer. They're used to distribute force whenever you're kind of using either like a screw uh, a, a screw or a bolt or whatever uh, between two materials, right? The other three are what we talked about, shaft collar, like uh, those are where you don't actually have to make any grooves and then you can use like a set screw or tighten a screw in order to get it on that shaft. Retaining rings are, you know, when you place them into the shaft themselves, and they kind of stay there nearly permanently. And set screws are kind of what we discussed before or what uh, what our good friend Sam over here uh, was talking about with uh, his doorknob. So, yep. Let's go on ahead. Okay, washers will give all but the following. Man, these are kind of hard questions. Yeah, gotta be honest. These are a little bit tricky. I had to think about this one. Yep, it does. It does not keep stray material out of the hole. Uh, so, for the seven people that answered, applies force upwards on the nut. It actually does do that. So, uh, if I go back to the presentation, it should make a little bit of sense, right? Like in this example, right? You have that washer at the bottom. And essentially, like, since that uh, nut is being tightened, it will provide a reaction force in the uh, nut's direction uh, just so that uh, there's a lot of friction between the threads themselves, and that prevents the uh, nut from coming loose. All right? Let's go to the next question. Okay, scoreboard looking pretty similar. Let's keep going. Which screw head type strips the easiest? I think I've only called out one of these guys. But remember what I was talking about with the screwdrivers, right? I don't think we use Torx head. No, I don't think anyone uses Torx head, gotta be honest. <laughs> All right, let's keep on going. Yes, the answer is Phillips head, right? And, uh, oh, you know what? Tip of the day. If you ever strip a screw head and your screwdriver can no longer, uh, what's it called? tighten that up or loosen it up. What you can actually do just to kind of fix things with duct tape in a way is you can use like a Dremel or some sort of like, a, you know, anything that removes a slight bit of material uh, out, of any, out of anything right on top of the Phillips head, right? So then you're cutting a groove into it and you can actually use a flathead screwdriver instead to uh, drive it out. And uh, that saved me on multiple occasions. But then if you start screwing the, if you start stripping the flathead, uh, you're in the same position as before, which is rather unfortunate. So let's keep on going. 
All right, next slides. Y'all are doing pretty well. Which Loctite color is the thread locker? We only have like two colors. Oh, I I remember this question because the the colors are like the actual color choices. Oh, you're right. Uh, although it would have been so fun if like the red one was actually like blue colored and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, oh that would be terrible. I would love that. It's kind of like one of those like um psychological challenges or what have you where like you have to read out like the color of the the words instead but like it's actually like what you're reading out are the or like the words that are on the screen are actually a different color those are fun green is for the retaining ring or uh, the retaining compound so uh, similar yeah, application. Zachary technically you're right they are all thread lockers of different strengths I think but um red is specifically called thread locker so It's just how it is. But yeah, yeah, Zach, you you would be absolutely correct, right? But because of those different strengths, they're typically recommended for specific uses, right? So let's keep on going. Uh, Zach is killing it. Friction fits include all but the following. Oh man, this is hard. One of these things is not like the other. All right, very nice. Holy crap, you guys oh. did super well there. Damn, son. Ta Ooh, actually, I'm, I'm, I would have answered taper fit as well. Hmm. I think the reason is because expansion fit isn't actually the name of any type of fit. Yeah. But uh, that's why. Yeah, yeah. That Tricky. that that's a good point. I might when I talked about taper fits, I might have screwed the wording up ever so slightly i my apologies on that one but yeah like the the other uh the other one press fit uh that's a that's a friction fit shrink fit right where you're actually having them overlap that's also a friction fit because it relies on friction to maintain those two materials from separating out of each other okay let's go next slide all right which pair is completely made up Big welding. <laughs> I like fig welding. I mean, I guess we gave it away, but yeah, that's fine. Oh yeah, we did just give it away. <laughs> I'm so I'm so dumb. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Let's keep on going. Well done, guys. You guys are killing it. All right, what's not a viable application of rivets? <laughs> oh man, this is we should we should change this question. <laughs> uh, ooh. I'm, I'm going to get this wrong. I'm going to get this wrong. That's why that's why I'm telling you guys you should change the question. Battery casing for your robots. Yeah. Why wouldn't you use it in the battery casing? Or why <laughs> would you use it in the battery casing? Why not? Rivets are fun. <laughs> <laughs> and you punch a hole in, or it, it goes too far in. That's not my problem. That's the problem of the battery. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a stupid mechanical member. I don't. And no, no. Mechanical members are chads, right? We're kings and right. queens, okay? It's the electrical and softer people that are wrong. Okay, let's go to the uh, finals. Let's see uh, how everyone did. Eight out of 10. Very nice. Very nice. Nine out of ten. Ooh, is someone gonna get ten out of ten? Yep. Yay! Yep, go. Let's go. Nicely done, guys. We need to make these either a little bit harder or make it a game of speed. One of the two. Very well done, guys. I promise you, like, if we were in person, or you know what, when this is all over, uh, you can just bug me and be like, "Hey, I won Kahoot! Give me some candy, right?" And since that's unfalsifiable, then I'll be forced to give you candy anyway, so you can just pretend to win. All right, I'm but that's pretty much it. A, I'm secretly keeping a log. Secretly keeping a log? Okay. Yeah. Kirtik won the first one. 
Yeah, Kirtig did win the first one. I don't remember who won the second one, but yeah, I I will promise you candy in the near future. Okay. Okay, I'm not secretly keeping log, but now I am. <laughs> All right, so I guess now is time for the CAD guide, right? Uh, so if you guys want to work this on work on this by yourself, like please do. But we will stick around for you guys to kind of take a. Uh, what's it called? We can either like help you through like different problems, right? Or give me a second. I apologize. I had a, I had a long day. It's taken me a while to do anything. <laughs> uh, let's yeah, see. yeah. So essentially, um, we looked at the res uh, the results of the poll uh, that we sent out last week, and we decided based on the results that uh, most of you are fine um, and can just work on it on your own. So from this point on, you can head out if you'd like. Uh, but there's a significant amount who still want us to go just at least skim through the CAD guides. So that's what we're going to do. Um, for anyone wanting step by step working through the CAD guide um, and you know picking over each slide and like how to do everything, showing you how to do it, um, that's what's available on our YouTube channel. So if you look up Robojackets training on YouTube, you'll find it. Um, and each week has a playlist. So. Um, to answer your question, you don't have access to the Google Drive with all the guides, um, but all the links that I've sent out are available. Um, you can find links within the videos. I don't. Uh, it's not RoboJackets. It's RoboJackets training. Ah, oops! I am yes. a big dumb. <laughs> um, yeah. So I've sent out links in the emails. I've, uh, there are links available within the CAD guides. Um, but yeah, you guys don't have access to a, a whole Google Drive with these. Um, you know, I will so yeah, in this, go ahead and put the link in, in the chat anyways. Yes. Um, yeah, also, so that, like, with access to the Google Drive, right? Next year, you can become mechanical trainers if you want, right? And yes. uh, you'll have access to all the spicy stuff, right? <laughs> it, it's a doable job. I was I took this class last year. Um, it's a good way to get leadership experience, but also only have a fall or a summer and fall commitment. It's also um, just really fun. I, I like teaching, yeah. even though I'm pretty exhausted today. Like I was looking forward to this. <laughs> All right, I guess uh, if everyone else is still on here, like um, I'll just skim through like what's going on. And again, like we'll stay here for a little bit longer in case you have any questions, okay? Sounds good? Yep. <laughs> yeah, uh, to, uh, just become a trainer and get CAD guides. <laughs> all right, let's go. Week three CAD guides. So this is gonna be holes and sheet metal, all right? Oh, let's press this. Kind of like what I discussed with, uh, you know, in the lecture itself, like whole tool is going to make you uh, make fastener holes like from a huge library, like a huge spreadsheet really quickly. You don't have to look up any like sort of uh, magic like chart. And uh, it's super helpful because it's just like one click away. OK. So what do all of these buttons mean? So like I kind of went over like the different types of holes and the different kinds of seats. So like counter, uh, counter bore and countersink are the main ones. Um, but essentially, like uh, you can specify like what type of thread you're using, right? And you can specify like how lo how long you want to make the threads, how long you want to make the hole itself, uh, what direction you want to make them, and so on and so forth. Uh, it has all those things in one neat little package. So when whenever you choose a location, right, it's going to automatically select like either in the last sketch that you just made, if you have like any like free floating points on there, or you can just click anywhere on the face uh, where you have a hole. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Like the, the most common way of like choosing a location is just like go in a sketch, uh, define a set of points. This is what I like to do personally. And then just uh, select the sketch and the whole tool to, uh, we'll place all the holes automatically at those points. Okay. Let's go ahead. So where do we use this tool specifically? Honestly, like the answer is everywhere. Like, <laughs> If there's a fastener there, we have used the whole tool, like guaranteed, unless if you have bad CAD, in which case not guaranteed. But we at RoboJack, it's like good CAD, okay? Uh, so on this is an example. This is Castawari from like a, a year ago. This was our 60-pound 
uh, weapon assembly. And we're just going to make a version of the, their disk. Well, I'm not going to make it. I'm just going to skim through it. But essentially, like, here's a very nice use case for you guys to be able to use the, the whole tool. OK. Then this just goes over making the actual shape itself, the extrude. OK. And after extruding it, you just uh, make the sketch on the top face to, I think this is for making the holes themselves or for where we're going to define the locations. Right. And then, uh, yep. To find more locations, place the holes themselves. And there we go. There we go. We've, uh, uh oh. Yeah. We Something worth hole. noting is we use points instead of circles for our holes. Um, you can use circles, but points are more efficient. They're also just a lot nicer to look at, right? Instead of having some undefined circles just throwing around your assembly and you don't have to like define a radius for your points at all right it's just two two things you have to define x to, x direction and y direction and that's pretty much it okay then just make this sketch uh yeah and this is where you're going to put the four holes that are on castle warrior itself use the settings that are shown in here right and then to make the d slot in the center of the disc um you can either like make the D, D shape in an extrude in a sketch and extrude, or you can make the hole and add material like we're doing right now. So while in the whole tool, just select the origin of this part and fill in these sec settings, and then extrude the for the rest of it. Okay. So here's making that D, D shape. Now afterwards, uh, with this sketch, uh, you you just make the hole over here with the settings on here. Then you make a circular pattern. These are really fun. I, I love circular patterns. Those are always like super satisfying to look at. But yeah, once you make one hole, you can just uh, use a circular pattern to make all of the uh, eight of them. I think there's on there. Yep. And that's pretty much it. And congratulations, you've made a senior members battle balls part, right? And now that you have like these tools at your disposal, you're pretty much able to like, um, you know, uh, you can make anything that you want with uh, what we have over here, but we will cover like assemblies and some other key stuff like later on. Okay. Now let's go on to sheet metal, right? So like I said before, it had, there's an option to create like sheet metal parts instead that you can flatten out and then put into a water jet, right? Uh, so <clears throat> there's two different ways to like make the sheet metal parts. So either like go into the sheet metal mode and inventor and do everything with uh, sheet metal tools. Or make a no normal part with like uniform thickness and then convert it into a sheet metal part. So typically just use the first method if the part is more complicated or when you have like the sheet metal tools uh, makes creating the part a lot easier, right? Both of them are equally valid and are gonna be outlined in this guide. So process one, if you have like constant thickness and uh, just a, a thin sheet, you can just convert it to sheet metal in the uh, 3D model tab over here, right? And then uh, you can change the defaults for like uh, the bending radius and the, the thickness of everything, right? You can just go into there to change it. Uh, so here's like where you actually get to outline what we're going to be making. So we're just going to make a re rectangular, rectangular sketch that we're going to be converting into, uh, I guess, something that we're going to be bending. Okay. Once you create the, the base, you can edit the settings if you want and then click OK. Just make sure that. Uh, you know, this bend radius over here, I think by default is the thickness of the part or thickness of the part times two, one of the two, but we don't really change that uh, that bend default like ever, I'll be honest. I've never had to change yeah. it. Usually we're, we're just doing sheet metal for the profile. So the thickness and the bend radius doesn't really matter all that much. No. All right, so next next part, we're going to be making the walls. So here's where you use the flange feature that I kind of mentioned before. And uh, you don't have to sketch anything. It's just you choose some edges, and uh, the magic is done for you, OK? Now you can repeat the slide, but then use the edges of the top wall to create the flange instead. Uh, and then uh, another important thing to know about sheet metal design is the difference between like a mitered edge and a non-mitered edge. If you want those two joints to like meet up together very nicely, you can actually define like a miter line like right across it so that they interface very nicely. And we'll show you how to do that. So uh, in the settings for whenever you're making the flange, you can actually go into, uh, I guess, the settings for the corner. 
and auto apply mitering so that way those two uh, will kind of interface with each other. And what you'll see, uh oh, that, that's later, but uh, it's kind of hard to see, but that edge over here is, is now mitered so that they will interface. Uh, all right. And afterwards, once we created this box looking guy, you can just flatten this out using like in the, under the sheet metal tab go to create flat part pattern, and then you can just export this as a DXF and manufacture it, okay? Some other stuff. Uh... Oh, after you flatten a part, right, all these lines will kind of dict uh, show you where all of the bends are. But if you want to go back to the folded part and you want to make some changes, right, or just want to do something else to it, you can uh, go back under the 3D model tool and then go to folded part instead, okay? And then uh, once you notice like the flat part, you can still add features to it and it'll reflect in your folded part. And uh, what's nice is like you can toggle it back to your folded part and it'll show you like all the bend lines, okay? And uh, is that it? That seems to be it. Uh, we're gonna stay on here for just a little bit more and uh, that's pretty much it. Hope you get, Hope you enjoyed. Shelf stairs sharing room. <laughs>